Thank you. Um, I'd like to say thank you to to everyone that that took took time out of your afternoon to to be with us. Um, I apologize ahead of time because I I don't I don't feel like I'm good at webinars. Um, I like to look at people face to face when I'm when I'm talking to them. So <clears throat> if at any time I'm stumbling along, well, it's it's because I'm I don't have anybody's face to look at. But anyway, um, thank you and thank you to Whitmix for for uh, allowing this to happen. And more importantly, hope, hopefully you'll get something out of this. Um, I want to be timely. I, I respect your time. But before we get started, there's a couple of things I want to mention, um, just simply because uh, when you when you talk to me, there's always something legally that I'm involved with, and sometimes it's brand new stuff. Uh, for those of y'all that are actually Medicare providers, okay, I want to mention to you that as of April 1st, there has been a, a change to the LCD, and the change took E0486, our code for our mandibular advancement device, and linked it with the code for CPAP. And if Medicare has paid for a CPAP within the last five years, as of March the 1st, they will not pay for an oral appliance. I don't know how that's affected your practices, but it's been tough on us. So we've been in contact with Medicare, complaining and, you know, refiling and all the things that you, you try to do. And um, we are now in the process of filing reconsiderations to get changes in the LCD in all four jurisdictions. So why am I mentioning this? When a Medicare patient comes into your office in the morning, okay, you need to get that patient to sign an ABN, okay, advanced beneficiary notice, and let them know that there has been a change in Medicare and that Medicare may not pay for this appliance. That way you put the patient on notice. If they go forward with the, with the appliance, you certainly have the right to, uh, to you know, then go in and collect for the appliance. So I just wanted to put you on notice with that. We're working hard to get that changed, but as of right now, that has not been changed. Okay. So let's get into the, the subject here. First thing I need to tell you, out of all of the lectures that you've ever listened to, this one, you need to stay to the end. The reason for that is I'm gonna spend about an hour showing you how messed up dental sleep medicine is and how messed up the law in dental sleep medicine is and then I'm going to let you know how I, as the dentist, attorney, boarded in sleep, how I deal with this. So this is just absolutely mandatory that you stay to the end. Um, that's the first thing. If there are people on this webinar that are, are brand new, um, I probably need to give you at least a few minutes history, or you really won't understand kind of where I'm coming from. But in dental sleep medicine, um, I, I like to say it's a house divided because on one side of our house, we have the American Academy of Sleep Medicine and the sleep physicians who control, you know, sleep medicine in general. And when dentists started getting involved in dental sleep medicine, I think they became quite concerned. Uh, concerned that number one, they could lose control of the, this practice. So they went in and put in a bunch of parameters, a bunch of restrictions, uh, basically in an effort to, I guess, make sure that dental sleep medicine was done with, with uh, a certain amount of professionalism and done with 
with their guidance and control. One of the things that they did, obviously, was put dental sleep medicine inside DME. Uh, being a DME piece of equipment, uh, that required a prescription from a sleep physician, and it required a letter, letter of medical necessity and a diagnosis from a sleep physician to make the appliance. That gave the sleep physicians relative control of the, uh, of the practice. Well, if you know anything about dental sleep medicine, you've probably figured out it's pretty difficult to get referrals from sleep physicians when you get started. So on the other side of the house, we have dentists that have maybe two or 3,000 patients inside their, uh, their practice, and maybe as many as a third of these patients have OSA. The problem is they're not diagnosed. When I lecture on, on uh, you know, how to get a dental sleep medicine practice going, I, I consistently tell patients or tell my attendees they really don't need to think of those undiagnosed patients as sleep patients because until they are diagnosed, they are really not a sleep patient, okay? They're just a screened patient that may screen positive. So anyway, we have, we have all these dentists that want to get a sleep practice going, and you may have 250 to 500 patients sitting there <clears throat> that you know has OSA, and yet, you know, if you, you, if you refer them to a sleep physician, they're going to be put on CPAP and not be offered an oral appliance. So this conflict between dentists wanting to practice dental sleep medicine, wanting to help our patients, and sleep physicians who want their patients to wear CPAP, wants to keep, they want to keep control of the profession, has resulted, I hate to say, in two protocols or two standards of care, but that's basically what it is right now. We have two different facets of our, of our practice. One group that is more or less trying to follow the AADSM protocols, meaning sleep physician diagnosis, patient goes to a sleep lab, most of the time they fail CPAP, and then somewhere down that chain they get referred to us. That's one side of this equation. The other side is you screen your patients, you then provide maybe some type of home sleep testing. That home sleep test is then uh, diagnosed by a remote sleep physician who has not seen this patient, okay? You get a diagnosis. Somehow you then get a prescription. And when I, when I say somehow, there's several different ways to go, it, go from it. Most common one is to use the patient's primary care physician to provide a prescription and a letter of medical necessity. And then you use the remote diagnosis and the prescription from the patient's PCP to fabricate your appliance. Both of those protocols have problems. So we're going to go through some issues on standard of care, issues on scope of practice. I'm going to go through board examination or board complaints that have been recently filed. I'm going to deal with a couple of lawsuits that, that we've had in dental sleep medicine. I want you to understand where the standard of care sets in dental sleep medicine and how that affects us. I'm going to try to close this. I'm assuming y'all can see this, this um, control panel. So I'm going to try to close it again. The last time I did, I lost audio. So if I lose audio, I'll, I guess, open it back up. But I'm going to try to close it. I hope we're okay.
So anyway, we're uh, obviously we're talking about the scope of practice. Uh, full disclosure, my wife and I own a consulting company where we actually help dental practices get uh, get their 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 practices going in dental sleep medicine. I provide forms and consents and all of those kind of things. Um, I'm also on the editorial board of Dental Sleep Practice Magazine, where I write a legal column. And uh, I hope y'all can still hear me. Um, can somebody let me know you're you're out there? We can still hear you. Okay, great. The last time I closed that control panel, um, I lost audio. So anyway, so. Um, I want you to know I have no agenda. You know, I am not trying to sell anything. I, you'll have to forgive me, I'm from Arkansas. You cannot take that out of me. So um, just understand all of that. I'm not giving legal advice and nothing that I say has been screened by Whitmix. So all of this is just my opinion. Um, if you really want an opinion on this, contact an attorney in your state. And uh, hopefully it'll be somebody that's familiar with uh, with the law and dealing with dental dental boards. Um, as far as credentials, um, my I guess my biggest one I I am a member of the bar in Arkansas and Texas. Many of the dentists that are also have a law license. If you know anything about them, most of them are actually not a member of the bar. They have gone to law school, but they are not practicing attorneys. I do practice. I was a full partner law firm. I'm not anymore. I'm one of three dentists in the country that's also a fellow of the American College of Legal Medicine. Kind of proud of that. So anyway, here we go. Uh, my biggest problem with dental sleep medicine is most people doing it don't do it well. So. I always caution people, um, this can, dental sleep medicine or obstructive sleep apnea can and does cause people to, to, to die. My dad died of a stroke in the middle of the night. He was a notorious snorer. So I always say, if a task is once begun, never leave it till it's done and be thy labor great or small, do it well or not at all. If you're one of those people that are not committed to doing this well, don't do this. Um, lawsuits are coming, so don't do it. So every time I turn around, some MD is accusing a dentist of practicing outside the scope, outside their scope of practice. That phrase really bothers me. And the reason it does is because it's not something that we use. That phrase is not something that we use in dentistry. And the reason it's not is because our definition of our practice is so large, virtually everything is within our scope. Um, medicine's not that way. Medicine has taken the human body and the treatment of the human body and divided it up like a cherry pie and every different branch of medicine has their slice out of that pie. Sleep medicine is that way. They do diagnosis treatment. Uh, they make their money primarily with, with uh, interpreting sleep studies, but that's their slice of the pie. And then here come, come dentists and we're, we're coming to the table and we're saying, okay, we want to wedge into this big cherry pie and sleep physicians are being resistant saying, no, we don't have room at the table for you. But anyway, what is scope of practice? Well, it's the procedures and actions and processes that you can do as a practitioner and do it in keeping with the terms of your license. So what the heck does that mean? Well, actually, there's three parts to it. Part number one or of, of your scope of practice is the definition of the practice of dentistry in your state. 
if you don't know what your definition is, you need to find out. Um, the, fortunately, most states have adopted the ADA definition, and I'm going to show you that in a minute. But you need to know what your definition is because that is the primary component of your, component of your scope of practice. However, most definitions are really broad, okay? And those definitions are limited by whatever your education is and your training is. So if you think about the definition of the practice of dentistry, you'll have oral pathologist on one end of the spectrum, you know, going in and sitting at a microscope all day, you know, looking at specimens. And on the other end of the spectrum, you have oral surgeons, you know what I'm saying, doing uh, maxillomandibular advancements. And interestingly enough, they're both practicing under the same definition of the practice of dentistry in, in most cases. There are some states that have different definitions for, sur excuse me, for surgeons, but most have one definition. So that definition is usually very broad. But anyway, the education limits your scope, but also state statutes and board opinions limit your scope. So if we look at dental sleep medicine and look at the definition of the practice of dentistry, this is the ADA definition, and this has been adopted by 28 states. Arkansas has adopted this definition, and it's incredibly broad. It's the evaluation, diagnosis, prevention, and or treatment of diseases, disorders, or conditions of the oral cavity, maxillofacial area, adjacent and associated structures, and their impact on the human body provided by a dentist within the scope of his education, training, and experience. Okay? If you look at that, and now let's talk about OSA. We all know OSA is, uh, is primarily caused by the tongue collapsing into the airway during sleep. Okay? If you look at that, the practice of dentistry is the diagnosis, prevention, and treatment of a disease, disorder, or condition of the oral cavity, maxillofacial area, adjacent structures. Well, that includes the tongue and their impact on the human body. So if you look at our diagnosis, or excuse me, our definition of the practice of dentistry, you would think, man, I can diagnose OSA. I can do anything dealing with OSA. But the next question, and I, I'm going to bring up North Carolina. I gave this, this lecture last week in North Carolina. This is their, their statute on the practice of dentistry. It's basically the same uh, disease, disorder, pain, deformity of the human teeth, gums, alveolar process, maxilla maxilla mandible adjacent tissues or structures of the oral cavity so you can diagnose and treat those but anyway if you look at that at this broad diagnose or definition of the practice of dentistry when i lecture i generally say you can put your thumb on your nose stick out your your finger and make a big circle and basically anything in that circle is going to fall within the practice of dentistry. Or, but when we talk about dental sleep medicine, and say, okay, well, OSA and the treatment and diagnosis of OSA and everything related to OSA probably falls within our definition of the practice of dentistry. But is our education level adequate to diagnose it? Is it adequate to manage all of the comorbid diseases and the ramifications of the disease? And that's where I think we fall short. Because in dental sleep medicine, right now, we have no recognized textbook. book. We have no recognized ADA graduate program. There is no specialty in dental sleep medicine yet. 
we do have some continuums and I, I get to participate in some of these, but I'm not sure any of these continuums qualify a dentist to control every aspect of OSA. Um, RPSGT, obviously that's a registered polysomnographic technician. These are the people that score the sleep studies. Um, the reason why that is so interesting to me, I go to the sleep lab all the time, and I'm about to take the exam. So in the sleep lab, I am grading my own patients, scoring them, counting up the events, and yet, does that still qualify me to handle all the ramifications of the disease? And the answer is no. Obviously, we have different areas that you can go get diplomates. Um, obviously, the I think the most recognized is the American Board of Dental Sleep Medicine, but that still is not like a residency that we do in, in sleep medicine. So our, our limiting factor certainly is our education level right now doesn't fall to the level that we probably are qualified to handle everything that goes along with 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 uh, sleep issues, but we're working on it. So <clears throat> we have number one within our scope of practice, we have the definition of the practice of dentistry. That's this big, broad, global definition, but it's limited by our education. Okay, for example, oral cancer is probably within our our definition of the practice of dentistry, but I'm pretty sure none of us are going to be responsible for the treatment of oral cancer. So our education limits that definition. The other thing that limits the definitions is board um, statements you know, statutes that states uh, have, have come up with. And this gentleman here, Samuel Flashman, was the AASM president <clears throat> in 2004, right when the board was about to put out the first set, well, the, the 2005 set of practice parameters. And Dr. Fleischman wrote, every board in the country trying to get the dental boards to come up with some type of statement that said dentists could not practice or could not diagnose OSA. Several boards responded. I say several, three or four responded. Oregon is one of them. It wasn't a very strong statement, but it says the ordering, interpreting, and managing of tests of sleep apnea, ordering, interpreting, and managing of tests for sleep apnea is outside the scope of dentistry, whereas making appliances is well within the scope of dentistry. So that's the that was one of the first ones. Connecticut did the same thing. They were kind of late coming out. It was in 2009. It said. For a general dentist, the sleep apnea would need to be diagnosed by a physician, and the prescription for the appliance would be necessary. Kind of a non-statement, but there it is. New Jersey has absolutely been amazing. Their first statement on obstructive sleep apnea was back in 2005. And the board has made these statements that have gone into the minutes and every time they make a statement they they actually refer this to the committee that drafts statutes for the state and here it is you know 2018 and new jersey still doesn't have a statute so all we have are board statements that are inside the minutes. So there is actually no law in New Jersey. There's no law in Connecticut. That's not a law. That is a statement by the board, okay? Same thing with Oregon. 
That is a statement by the board. It is not a law. But New Jersey says the dentist cannot order or interpret the home sleep test or screen treatment plan or diagnose sleep apnea patients. So if you practice in New Jersey right now, the patient that sits in the chair that looks like me, a big old burly guy, you can't even screen him. Obviously, that's not what the board meant, but legally, that's what it says. What they meant to say is that you cannot use testing equipment to screen your patient. You can't use home sleep testing equipment to screen your patient, but that's not what they said. So the problem is, we have all of these, anytime you see one of these SOC questions, and I've kind of mixed them in and out, and this is when I love to interact with, with people at, at my meetings, because you would be amazed at what people say, but the question is, how many people would fabricate a mandibular advancement appliance to treat snoring? without a prescription from a physician or sleep physician or sleep physician. Now, before you say yes or no, which I couldn't hear anyway, probably, understand this is a 34 year old patient, snores every night and had a PSG two years ago and the PSG showed an AHI of 3.2. So for my newbies out there, that means they had an overnight in-lab sleep study and the results was within the normal range. So this patient doesn't have OSA by definition. So patient states that she, it's a female, she is always tired. Epworth sleepiness scale. Again, for my newbies, that means she is very sleepy okay dangerously so dangerously so so the question is do you need to involve the patient's sleep physician or physician to treat her snoring now again for my newbies um this patient actually most likely has upper airway resistance syndrome and if you if you went back and rescored the sleep study and scored RERAs, respiratory effort related arousals, um, you probably would get an RDI, a respiratory disturbance index that was much higher than this. But trust me, I go to lab all the time, and most of the time RERAs are not scored. So anyway, this patient probably has. Uh, upper airway resistance syndrome. And the question is, do you need a prescription to, to uh, treat her? So before you answer that, let's look at a few things, okay? If I can get it up. Uh, I put this in also, do you refer all patients to a sleep physician for evaluation, when, even when the only symptom is mild or moderate snoring? Again, 32-year-old female, BMI of 24, so not obese at all, no excessive daytime sleepiness, no diagnosed comorbid diseases, so no high blood pressure, no, nothing to worry about on this patient, no significant oral signs of OSA, and has not had a PSG but she's 32, she has no comorbid diseases. All she does, she has mild or moderate snoring. Now the question is, think about how many people we're talking about that have mild snoring most nights. In this country, we're probably talking 200 million people. Do all of those people need to be sent to a sleep physician? So now that I probably have you totally confused, let's go ahead. So what's the protocol? 
Is there a protocol? Okay. Is there any written protocol when the patient comes in and says, I just want a snore guard? So what do you do? So here we go. Let's talk about it. West Virginia Board of Dentistry, Dr. R treated patients who snored. Okay. Patients wanted a snore guard. The Virginia board ruled that Dr. R violated these statutory sections in that he practiced outside the scope of dentistry and or failed to conform to acceptable standards of care when he treated these patients for obstructive sleep apnea without first obtaining a diagnosis of that uh, by, by a physician. His, his position was he was just treating the, the patients. The board's position is you don't know whether they had OSA or not. So anyway, he was um, negligent. So the question becomes, okay, final sleep studies. Do you have to do final sleep studies on every patient? Because if your practice is like mine, most patients don't, know, don't want to go back to the sleep lab. What do you do with these patients? So anyway, this is uh, this is actually Stetson and that's Stephen. Here I am in my station in the sleep lab. Obviously, we're scoring patients. This is one of my patients in REM. These are the eyes popping. Um, obviously, sawtooth patterns of REM. These are the chin EMGs, um, and you can see the saturation. And that's uh, when you get an oral appliance in a patient's mouth. They look like that in REM. It's a good day. So anyway, we're back to Dr. R. He uh, failed to obtain follow-up PSGs to determine efficacy of his appliances. So they hammered him for that. So what were his sanctions? He had a public rec reprimand that went on his record. $10,000 penalty, but that wasn't a big deal. For two years, the board came back in his office and audited him. Uh, and looked at his OSA patients. So let's talk about snoring. We all know the AEDSM, AASM practice parameters. The number one parameter says that we recommend that sleep physicians provide prescribe oral appliances rather than no therapy at all for adult patients who request treatment for snoring without obstructive sleep apnea. I can only surmise by that, that that means a patient that's had a PSG and they snore, then the, the sleep physician then prescribes, which means writes a prescription for the appliance. That would seem fairly clear, but we've got this. So don't get discouraged when you see all of this, okay? I'll tell you how I deal with it in a minute. This is the 2013 AADSM treatment protocols for oral appliance therapy. And at the end of the first paragraph, it says the treatment of primary snoring does not require a physician's prescription or a physician or the physician refers the patient directly to the dentist for OAT as appropriate. So all you can say is that that's in direct conflict. It's within two years from the same organization. So how many of you have a sleep physician? And I mean sleep physician write all of your mad prescriptions. By sleep physician, no PCPs, no internists, no cardiologists, no, no anybody, just a sleep physician. The reason why I bring this up is that if I had to have a prescription from a sleep physician, every time I made an appliance, that'd be a bad day because in my area, we treat a number of military people. They were diagnosed by a sleep physician at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, 
10 years ago, the sleep physician is no longer in the military and there's no way to get in touch with them. The records are, are nowhere available. They have not contacted the sleep physician in my area and they're going to Iraq, you know, in 30 days. If I couldn't go to that patient's PCP and get a prescription, we'd just be in trouble. But if you look, these are the two, and I'm sorry about the quality of this, but if you look at, this is the actual photocopy of the 2015 practice parameters. It says sleep physicians write the prescription. Oral appliance is prescribed by the sleep physician. We recommend that the sleep physician consider prescription for OH for oral appliances. We suggest qualified dentists provide oversight. We suggest sleep physicians conduct follow-up testing. We suggest sleep physicians and qualified dentists instruct patients treated with oral appliances. Nowhere in the practice parameters does it say anyone other than sleep physicians can write this. When this came out, um, I don't know. If, I don't know where y'all are from, but in Arkansas, we have hissy fits. Um, I had a hissy fit, and contact. I complained, and I, you know, wrote letters, and I contacted Jerry Barrett, and said, "This, you can't do this, you know, because if we get a a prescription from someone other than a sleep physician, there's going to be a legal presumption that we violated the standard of care." So anyway, what I got in response was a letter from Randy Prince. And if you don't know who that is, that's the secretary for the board, uh, for the AADSM. Randy Prince wrote me an email that basically said, it's okay for someone other than a sleep physician to do this. Will that stand up in court? No way. It's an it's a email from a secretary. So. All I can tell you is try to get a sleep physician to prescribe these. When a PCP in my area refers a patient, many times they send me a prescription, you know, just basically on their script pad. And um, hopefully that patient has a local sleep physician. I go in and, and do an intake, send a send my prescription to the local sleep physician, inform them that Miss Jones is in my office and uh, that she's failed CPAP and would you please sign a prescription. I don't tell the PCP that I went to the sleep physician for a prescription, but I just want to cover my tail, okay? So, uh, but anyway, so sleep physician's supposed to write these things. Okay, Mississippi, yay. It is within the scope of practice for a dentist to order an overnight pulse oximetry to determine the presence of sleep apnea. So they said yes, and that was a 2015 meeting. So we have one board that's actually said, yeah, you can probably do a pulse ox. So obviously a gym pro is, is in. They did not state, <clears throat> excuse me, an HST was okay, but at least we, we have this from Mississippi. Okay, Georgia. This is the worst written statute that we have. And notice down at the bottom, this is actually a statute. This is law in Georgia, okay? It says that the design, fitting, and use of oral appliances and maintenance of oral health related to the appliance falls within the scope of practice of dentistry. Yay, okay? The continued evaluation of a person's sleep apnea, which we do every day, the effects of the oral appliance on the apnea, which I do multiple times a day, and the need for and the type of alternative therapy or alternative treatment do not fall within the scope of dentistry. If I lived in Georgia, remember that hissy fit thing? That would not work. Literally, every time a patient comes in, you're evaluating whether the oral appliance is helping the sleep apnea, whether it needs to be titrated. 
whether or not you need the patient on on some type of positional therapy. In Arkansas, we have big patients. I mean, they're there's some big boys here, and many of them get referred for weight loss and bariatric surgery and you know lots of things. I have th- or excuse me, two patients now that have trachs. So the simple fact that I don't get to determine whether my therapy is working is not a good thing. Additionally, it says the prescribing of sleep apnea appliances does not fall within the scope of dentistry. That obviously means a real doctor needs to do that, not us. It is the position of the board that a dentist may not order a sleep study. The problem is, what do they consider a sleep study and what do they consider ordering? What what is their definition of ordering? Because I literally order PSGs, overnight sleep studies, every day. Okay. When I get through titrating my patients, we're picking up the phone and calling central scheduling and, and scheduling Miss Jones back in the sleep lab. The order is then sent to their sleep physician who signs the order for the study. But am I ordering it by picking up the phone and getting the patient in the sleep lab and determining they're ready to go back? I don't know. What is a sleep study? They didn't tell us. We don't know if that includes pulse oximetry whether that includes an HST or whether it includes a PSG or all of the above. So I would fight this as being, first thing, this prevents you from from practicing dental sleep medicine here. This is legally vague and ambiguous. Additionally, it says home sleep studies should not be ordered and interpreted, or excuse me, should be ordered and interpreted by a licensed physician. What does ordering mean? Again, that goes back, and it doesn't let me know whether a titration study that I do in the process of treating my patients, which is not sent to a sleep physician for interpretation, I'm using it to determine oxygen desats and and whether or not I'm going in the right direction. Does that constitute a sleep study? Because I'm not doing it to achieve necessarily a formal diagnosis. So again, I would say the bottom part is vague and ambiguous. So uh, hopefully nobody in this this conference is in Georgia because if if so you're you're probably depressed by now but this will eventually be overturned so if you are don't don't fret so anyway North Carolina I am working with North Carolina right now uh Bobby White who's the attorney that wrote this um realizes that North Carolina's got a problem anyway we had one of the doctors in a that uh, went to the North Carolina, the mini residency, wrote the board and asked whether or not they could do HSTs. And the board came back, or he said he would screen the patient, he would uh, dispense the HST, the data would be read by a sleep physician, and y'all know the routine. North Carolina, this is their di- this is their definition of the practice of dentistry, and the board's opinion. Remember, this is an opinion, and it wasn't published. In other words, when the board wrote this, the board, I think, thought they got it wrong. Um, I got it from a client of mine. But anyway, the board's opinion said the screening of patients for obstructive sleep apnea. Now, think about it, screening of patients. And being involved in the diagnosis of this condition, including dispensing home sleep test units, exceeds the scope of practice of dentistry in North Carolina under the Dental Practice Act. So, according to this letter, you can't even screen 
you can't be involved in the diagnosis of this condition. So if you're sitting there looking at a patient and you know that you know that you know that you know that patient has OSA, it doesn't even look like you can screen or recommend that they go to a sleep physician because that's being involved in the diagnosis. Again, vague, ambiguous, poorly written, and thankfully Bobby knows it now. Uh, anyway, um, the big thing that bothered me about this is this statement. So this is the thing I just, just read to you. Again, this is Bobby White. He's an attorney, he's not a dentist with North Carolina. It says the board also noticed that you may want to inquire with the North Carolina Medical Board about whether such conduct would involve, involve the practice of medicine in this state. There's a lot of history deal behind that statement. Um, it goes all the way back to Dr. Fleischman. It was picked up by Kelly Carden, who was a sleep physician in Nashville. Kelly Carden was on the board of the AASM and ended up being on the board of the AADSM. And she said, if you order an HST, you are practicing medicine without a license. And since she started lecturing everywhere about that, we occasionally see these things pop up and I'll show you in a minute what that brought us to. So anyway, now we have a North Carolina newsletter. Notice the date of it. This is secondary to a couple of phone calls that I had with, with Bobby and he's got it better. He says now uh, in the dental board's opinion, being involved in the diagnosis of OSA, including dispensing home sleep testing, would fall outside the scope of practice of dentistry and would violate the board's statutes and regulations. However, a dentist can perform initial and preliminary screening for OSA, including identifying certain risks and make referrals to the appropriate medical advisors. After this came out, again, I wrote Bobby a long letter saying, you got to take this out. Okay, uh, because screening in and of itself is being involved in the diagnosis. So we'll see where that goes. Okay, HST and pulse ox protocol. If your state does not have a regulation against HST or pulse ox, can you assume that it's okay? Now, up until six months ago, I was I would have said yes. It's kind of like not having a stop sign at an intersection, and and one day you put up a stop sign, and then you go in and arrest all the people that didn't stop the day before. Well, if you think about it, if there is no regulation in any way on HST usage. How can the board hold me or anyone else responsible when it falls within the diagnosis of a condition that my, my definition of practice of dentistry says is perfectly fine? So the question I'm asking is, can a dentist order an HST study? Can it be scored and diagnosed by a re remote physician, MAB prescription by the patient's PCP? What do you do if your state says nothing? Okay, this is the case that made me go, oh my goodness. <clears throat> I'm representing a, a dentist in Pennsylvania as we speak. There was no board, state board rulings on, on dental sleep medicine at all. No statutes on DSM, no statutes on HST. Dr. J, my client, ordered an Aries HST for diagnosis of OSA. The Aries was dispensed out of his office. The HST data was read by and diagnosed by Dr. Ali, uh, Chandra Ali. She is a board certified sleep medicine specialist. 
the prescription for the oral appliance was provided by the patient's PCP, uh, Dr. Gouillard, okay? So the question is, remember me talking about a house divided? Well, he's on the left side of the house. There are literally, in my opinion, you know, thousands of dentists doing exactly what he did. And to my knowledge, there has not been a board ruling that held a dentist doing that, um, you know, to have violated the standard of care or a scope of practice. The problem is Dr. J has been charged with practicing medicine without a license. And it's a criminal charge. He could go to prison. He's also been charged that he was charged by the medical board in his, in his state. He's also charged by the board of dentistry for practicing outside his scope. Now, let me give you the history on this. And I'll tell you where we are right now. First thing, Dr. J never made the appliance for this patient. She came in, he did the intake exam, he dispensed the HST, he got it scored, she came out a mild, okay? He, and I'm trying to, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for the right words. He informed the patients of the results of that test, okay? Um, the patient went home and she lives next door to an oral surgeon. And from the best we can find out, the patient talked to the oral surgeon's wife and the oral surgeon's wife talked to her husband and the husband said, he can't do that. He's practicing medicine without a license. So the patient was convinced apparently by the oral surgeon to make complaints to these respective boards. So where we are in this, the investigation is complete. Formal charges by the prosecuting attorney have not come down. We have written a huge brief talking about, you know, the fact that we are a house divided, that there are no established protocols and I listed literally every commercial interest in the country that is teaching um, HST usage for diagnosis, and they're all listed. And they're listed as a, as a reason why this is not an unusual or unsafe practice. Um, that was the brief went in um, a month and a half ago, let's, let's see, yeah, a month and a half ago, I have not heard anything back from the prosecuting attorney for Pennsylvania, so I don't know exactly where this will go, um, maybe uh, Whitmix will have me come back once this is through and we can talk about it, um, and, and we'll know more about where to go, but as I say, there's there's only one one response to something like this. And I wish this video that I want to show you had sound. It has sound on my end, but we tried this several times before uh, before this this webinar and we couldn't get sound. But anyway, this video shows the New Zealand rugby team and they're doing their and I think it's called the haka. They're they're screaming at the other rugby team, and it's it's quite dramatic, you know. I mean, they're they're getting them, and uh, this is kind of like, I guess, the board of dental examiners doing to us. I mean, they're screaming at us, "Don't do this stuff!" And sometimes there's just not a response other than you know what 
what these gentlemen did for the for the New Zealand hockey team. So that's kind of like how I feel about this board, you know, charges. Um, I just wish I knew the results. So anyway, we're going to talk about standard of care in dental sleep medicine real briefly, and I'm going to go through this and only to to show you kind of um, where all of this is going. Um, obviously, I I did. Um, a lecture at the ADA this this past year on standard of care in OSA and whether or not screening was the new standard of care. But anyway, the problem with the standard of care in dental sleep medicine is there's not one. And people sit there and say, well, well, how is that? How could that possibly be the case? Well, you have to understand how standards of care are established. They're established by getting law cases to a jury and then the jury ruling on them. And we've only had a few cases um, that have been filed and we haven't gotten any of them to a jury yet. So anyway, this is the, the most recent one that we actually got completed. Uh, this gentleman treated this patient for almost 10 years, uh, never got an informed consent, made two appliances, um, it, the allegations were that he failed to properly evaluate this person, uh, whether the person was an appropriate patient for an oral appliance. Uh, the reason I blocked this stuff out is you don't need the name, need the names of the doctors, but uh, the appliance companies were actually sued in this also. Um, anyway, he failed to properly instruct the patient in the use of this appliance. He failed to evaluate whether the patient was properly using the appliance. He failed to evaluate whether he uh, properly supervised the patient's use of the appliance and failed to get informed consent. So anyway, um, the, our good doctor was sued for consent, two appliances, almost 10 years, no written consent. Uh, he had complications of mad therapy. He had TMD. Uh, the last appliance he made, the patient was moving it too far, too fast. He got the joints blow, blown up. We also had tooth movement. The patient ended up with MMA surgery, and his complaint was that the dentist negligence resulted in his necessary surgery. Um, we ended up having to settle the case primarily because of no consent and the fact that 10 and a half years of treatment and a page and a half of notes. So don't do that. Uh, if you don't have a good consent form, you know, get with us. We can, we can hook you up. But anyway, so no exam, no records, no recall. He didn't bring you back. Uh, lack of monitoring, no testing, no, uh, no Jim Pro or, you know, or, Docs T3 to test effectiveness, no PSG at the end, uh, no final PSG, lack of patient instructions. Basically, there was no records on that. The big deal is lawsuits are coming, and uh, will you be ready? To file a lawsuit and to win, you have to have a duty. Well, we all have duties to our patients, and our duty is to make sure that what we do complies with what a reasonable and prudent practitioner would do. And if we breach that duty, in other words, we don't do what a reasonable practitioner would do, if that breach proximately causes damage, in other words, an injured patient, then you can lose the lawsuit. Uh, I'm not gonna go into long discussion about rubber dams and, and root canals, but Obviously, we know a rubber dam is standard of care, but um, you cannot use a rubber dam. And if the, the root canal fractures, okay, that may not have anything to do with the rubber dam. So the, the, the breach has probably caused the damage. So if you breach the standard of care, will you get sued? I love looking at patients when they're looking at it people in lectures when you ask that question, because all, almost all of them think the answer is yes. Well, the answer is no, okay? Uh, we literally 
trying to do the best dentistry we possibly can do breach the standard of care all the time. We don't get sued for it. We get sued for having a bad outcome on a patient who do, does not like you. I call them patient friends, okay? If you have a bad outcome on somebody that actually likes you, you don't get sued, okay? Uh, I do a big old long two-day, you know, how to stay out of trouble, you know, lecture. And I have these things called Ken's Creeds. And my number one Ken, Ken's Creed is make friends. And if you're not particularly friendly, you know, go hire somebody that is, you know, let them make friends with your patients. But you want your patients to really like you and like your office. So friends don't sue friends. And again, that's my number one Ken's creed. So anyway, make friends, look for a way to do that. I literally say if you if you can't go out to have a beer or have lunch with, with your patient, then remove them from your practice. So anyway, the standard of care in this case is what a reasonable and prudent practitioner would do. My wife just came in and told me to hurry, so I'm going to try to speed up. Well, obviously, the question is, what is a reasonable and prudent practitioner? Well, that's kind of hard to say. So who determines what is reasonable? Okay. Is it your state's laws and statutes? Is it the ADA policy statements? The practice parameters, state board of examiners. Nah, it's none of those guys. It's what your, if I can get to it, it's what the jury says, okay? And it's what the jury says in hindsight, okay? That kind of makes it difficult because we have had zero cases make it to a jury. That's why I say we really don't have a standard of care yet. And I don't want to be the one to establish a standard of care. I don't want to be the dentist that is doing something really, really weird and uh, starts establishing this standard of care. So the standard of care literally is whatever 12 people in the jury box says it is. But so if there isn't an established standard of care, so what do we do? You know, I'm going to go through a few questions and, and just show you that we don't have a standard of care. I always ask the people in my lectures, how many allow your patients to titrate their appliances? And I ask that because part of the, the issue in the lawsuit I just showed you is that the patient was titrating their appliance and he was still sleepy. He still had symptoms. And he was really cranking that sucker. And he went too far too fast. In my office, we don't allow patients to titrate their appliances. But usually, it's divided 50-50. So what's the standard of care? There isn't one. How many teeth per arch is necessary? You know, zero, you super glue them in. Or zero, you use tongue retaining devices. Or six or eight or 12. Well, the AADSM, I think, now has basically come out and said, hey, but how much research has been done on that? Does it matter which eight teeth? Well, we all know it does because some teeth are certainly stronger than others. The, the better question is how much perio is too much, okay? Again, no research has been done. So what do you do when you have a patient with significant perio and yet they've got an AHI of, of 45 and you either treat them or they're going to have a stroke. That's when consent and the right forms to deal with this is important. What you do is you actually have the patient sign a release of liability as it pertains to their, their perio and you make them an appliance because Air always trumps T. But if you don't get a good consent and this perio gets totally out of control, you're in trouble. Okay, so keep him going. So, how many people always make a morning repositioner? Again, 
it's usually 50 50. you know i don't care what morning repositioner you make just make one if you want to do a five dollar am aligner from you know airway management that's fine but in the lawsuit i just showed you part of the the issue was the dentist did not make a morning repositioner and the patient had tooth movement but no standard of care yet so there's no studies on them uh i love hard acrylic you know the patient can really bite into them the hard acrylic usually prevents you know upper tooth movement where you know sometimes that that's a part of the issue but anyway the point is there's no studies on it but um you know do do something face-to-face -face examination with sleep physicians before you fabricate a mad you know how many refer all your sleep patients remember we just we just had part of that discussion the 2013 practice parameter says requires a face-to-face -face, and it has to be a sleep physician okay it has to be one that's had the year uh, training and and certified by the american board of medical specialties so the question is how many do that for every one of their patients i wish i could say i always did that but i don't because on my military guys that are you know headed off to iraq we don't have time um we have five sleep physicians in northwest arkansas and most of them are booked two months or, or more in advance and the guy's going to iraq next month so what do you do so obviously medicare says face-to-face -face clinical evaluation and medicare's lcd says that's within six months of the treatment so within six months they've got to have a face-to-face -face or you can't make an oral appliance or the prescription is not valid so anyway medicare refer all your patients for sleep physician for final psg i wish i could say i always did that i always try but it doesn't always work i have an informed refusal for those patients they have every right to say no but they have to sign the the document that says i told you that we will get better results if you go back for a final PSG. How many refer for weight loss? We do that all the time and it helps our results a lot. Informed refusal if they don't. People say, well, why is that a big deal? Well, weight loss is classified, or excuse me, obesity is classified as a disease. And there is a treatment, weight loss clinics, bariatric surgery, if we don't do that is it a violation of the standard of care or a breach i don't know but i don't want to be the one to find out how many employ positional therapy i do that all the time or they sign a release okay so how much tmd is too much that's the the question my wife's coming in here saying you're going way too slow so anyway, let me go so who defines our standard of care what I'm going to do, I'm going to go through some slides pretty quickly, but what you need to know is the ADA passes policy statements that quickly become our standard of care. They recently did that, well, I say recently, 10 years ago. Obviously, it's not dental schools. It's not the, the state statutes and all that, that that determine our standard of care. We know what a standard of care is. Okay, but the standard of care is whatever the jury says, and that includes all the statute, statutes. But the ADA involvement in the standard of care, they pass the definition of the practice of dentistry, they pass policy statements, and the policy statements become learned treatise hearsay ex exceptions, and they're immediately introduced in court so the jury actually gets to see the ada policy statements so to give you an example uh again when i'm lecturing live i talk about oral cancer screening how many screen well the reason we do that 
is the ADA passed a policy statement and it was in 2010 and it says, you are to screen for malignant lesions in early stage cancers while performing routine visual examinations of all patients, particularly those that use tobacco and consume alcohol. Once this was passed, every plaintiff's attorney in the country saw that because they can they can access that on the ADA website. So now this is the standard of care. And if you don't look and document in your records that you looked, okay, then you could be negligent if, if a patient comes down with oral cancer. So with that being said, we brand, we basically have a brand new policy statement on sleep disorder breathing. It says we're supposed to screen, and that's the first uh, page. And it says we're in a great position to find upper airway resistance and obstructive sleep apnea. You know, we play an essential role. We're supposed to screen kids, okay, refer them, okay. But this is the big deal. We're encouraged as dentists to screen all patients for sleep-related re disorder breathing, okay? But getting down to the meat of it, which is right here, it says that dentists who provide oral appliance therapy to patients should monitor and adjust the oral appliance for efficacy. And you can use type three, which is HSTs, and type four, which is high resolution pulse oximetry to do that. So the ADA policy statement says, not only is it recommended, but we can certainly use pulse oximetry and HSTs to monitor our patients and get the best results possible. These are the rest of the, the policy statement saying surgery is possible. We should get continuing education. We should maintain communication with sleep physicians and follow up testing. <coughs> Excuse me. We're almost to the end. If you have your phones, take a picture of this screen. This is how. I got around and and made the, all of this okay with my sleep physicians. What we have is the AASM and the AADSM basically saying, don't you even think about having HSTs or using HSTs to screen or using HSTs to, to titrate your patients. And so we have the AASM saying that, then we have the ADA saying, yeah, it's okay to have HSTs and high resolution pulse oximetry. And the ADA position is ultimately going to be our standard of care. But we've got to get some cases to the courts and we've got to get jury precedents established before it happens. Well, anyway, this letter basically says that the AASM guidelines and the ADA guidelines now are in conflict. These policy statements and guidelines seem to be in direct contradiction with each other. Therefore, I need your help, and I want to meet with you to discuss how you want me to handle appliance titration and appliance screening. If it's not too much trouble, could we get together and discuss how and discuss how we will determine the efficacy of oral appliance therapy here in Northwest Arkansas? Let me know of a convenient time. If I told you all the things I do for my sleep physicians with HST and pulse ox, you would be amazed. What you will quickly find out is most sleep physicians do not care if you are using high resolution pulse ox for screening. They don't care if you're using HST to titrate. 
They just want to make sure that the patient is referred to them for an in-lab PSG. Now that's not the case in every location. It still is the case in my location. You just want to make sure that your sleep physicians are on board with whatever you're doing. Um, the five sleep physicians that refer to me, um, they each have a little bit different protocol of how they want me to handle things. But as long as you're upfront and, you know, on board with them, they don't seem to have a problem. So I would highly encourage you to let them know prediction, let them know you would like them to help you determine how you're going to titrate the, these patients. So anyway, conclusion, we've discussed scope of practice. Our scope of practice is huge. The question that we might have to answer about our scope of practice it's what is our educational background and do we have the education necessary to perform the treatment and provide the treatment we're performing? Um, these webinars are a, a good thing to, to document. You took this webinar, get the, get the CE for it so you can show you took these things. We discussed the standard of care. There is not one, so be careful. Become friends with your local sleep physicians. You know, I try to adopt the AASM practice parameters where I can, but I use the ADA policy statement. So um, you'll find out that the, the sleep physicians don't really care. They just want to be in the loop. And so make sure you keep them in the loop. So my only regrets that I didn't start sooner. My dad died of obstructive sleep apnea. He had a stroke in the middle of the night. And unfortunately, I didn't know enough about sleep apnea to do anything to help him. So y'all need to go out and, and make the world a better place and save lives. And uh, if there's anything I can do, I, I will certainly do it. Um, there is this this lecture is actually weirdly a two part series in about a month. We're going to do this again and I'm going to show how I use HSTs and, and high resolution pulse oximetry in my practice to get absolutely great results. So um, you'll the next one will kind of pick up from here and show you how I think that HSTs and and uh, the gym pro is just indispensable in getting good results. So if you get re good results, you get lots of referrals and have a successful practice. So with that being said, I turn this back over and uh, I know I went long, I apologize. Um, so is there a question? Hello, is anybody yes. there? Yes. <laughs> Uh, there are people there. I'm waiting for questions. I don't see any type yet. Just statements about the about hearing. I yeah. If there are no questions, then um, of course we thank uh, Dr. Burley very much for for a great presentation. And don't forget, as he just mentioned, there's a second part in the series on June 18th. That's uh, 19th, I'm sorry, uh, implementing dental sleep medicine. And just a reminder again, and Dr. Burley just did that, uh, if you would like CE credit, uh, AGD or ADA SERP, then uh, within 24 hours you will be contacted and we will explain what we'll do to help you uh, receive that credit. So no other, no questions. So Dr. Burley, thank you so much for your great presentation and um, we'll see you all hopefully again in in a in a few weeks and uh have a good and safe evening thank you so much all right take care dr bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.